All right. We're live. I did have some issues yesterday getting the video stream to play at, let's say, a good quality. So hopefully those are resolved today. I think there was a problem on the YouTube receiving end. So if it starts buffering again, what I'll probably do is just power through and upload the finished product at the end. So hopefully that doesn't happen again. If it's really bad, I might just stop a stream altogether and go to a recorded mode instead. But hopefully it doesn't come to that. All right, so today we're going to talk about real-time networking because the bonus for your homework was basically a real-time networking problem. And I just posted the solution to your homework to Canvas about a minute ago there. And I'm going to go ahead, and that solution includes the bonus. And I'm going to go ahead and, somehow that happened, run it. I'm going to run the server end. And let's have you guys run the client end. And we're going to see if it manages to, uh, you know, function with a bunch of you guys connected. So I'm going to run the client end, and we're going to see if it, We can draw on the screen, all of us together. Now let's just make that the whole screen. Why not? So go ahead and pull up the solution. I'm going to try to get it going here, and then I'll, I'll run it as the server in a bit. But first we're going to go and look at the code. And then we're going to, ooh, that's not great. Looks like it doesn't want to connect today. I'll give that one more go. Let's just try refreshing. Give another shot. And let's come back to that in a bit. <laughs> let's see if that's come back. So not the first time. We've had issues there. Let's just look over the code then first, and then we'll get back to that and see if we can try it at a later time. Okay, so there's quite a bit to it, and there's so much that I don't really want to uh, retype it all. Uh, so we're just going to go over it uh, in its finished form, which is a little bit unusual. because I, I usually like to go through how I make it, but in this case I just feel like it's a little bit too long for us to really do that. So. I'm going to go ahead and do it in its finished form. It looks like uh, it's loading over there. All right, cool. We are loading now. So first, you'll see I have a lot of classes. And that was probably the way that yours ended up as well. I think the, the smallest that anybody really got it down to is something like five classes. And that's not a bad thing. So don't really be afraid of generating a ton of classes when you're making a, a larger networked application, especially one that has so many components like this one. So we have the networked element to it, we have the graphical element to it. So there's quite a bit going on there. All right, um, first let's look at the two drivers. Okay, so the driver for the client and the driver for the server. We see that there's going to be a lot of linking going on uh, later on. So there's going to be a lot of uh, different things getting tied together in the driver. That's That's where a lot of people had their biggest stopping block actually was that part of the whole object oriented thing. Remember you can always pass references to instances of one thing and instances to another thing along as long as they're all glued together in a common place and the common place that you normally glue those things together is in the driver. That's really what the driver is for. It's for you to make all your different objects and then link them together in the way they need to be linked and then get the ball rolling in whatever way it's supposed to be. So that just goes back to your 228 days learning how to do object-oriented code. A lot of this stuff isn't ideal. I probably have things that are linked together that didn't have to be linked together, but, you know, it is what it is. It, it, it doesn't really have to be optimal. 
All right, let's look at the server first. So the server is basically directly copied from the example that I gave you. I actually don't think there are any changes here. But this was a stopping block for a few people who tried to use the lab version instead. The key difference between the lab version and the one from the example that I gave you in class is that the lab version only needs to handle a single TCP connection at a time. And I asked you to write a program that handles multiple clients being connected at a time, which makes sense because this is supposed to be able to allow multiple people to draw at once. So, speaking of, let's see if that guy is loaded yet. All right, it is. Get into Eclipse here. Start working on the server. The key line that needs to happen inside of the server's thread in order for it to accept multiple clients is this server.accept line. So the server socket listens for incoming TCP connections and establishes the handshake with them. And then when it uh, completes the handshake, it gives them a socket. That's what the server.accept line does. So if you did the server.accept line and then inside of the same loop you continued to do other work that stopped you from being able to get the server.accept again, um, or you simply forgot to put the server.accept into a loop or into a thread, then you could only accept one TCP connection. Um, because it wouldn't be able to call that server.accept again. So it was essential that you had it inside of a loop, and it was essential that you had it inside of a thread so that it could continue to sit there and get new connections. Remember, this is a blocking call. The code doesn't advance beyond this line until it gets a new connection. Once it gets a new connection, then it advances to the next line. And in this example here, uh, it prints out that it accepts a connection, and then it spawns a new worker, and as we'll see soon, that worker is also itself going to run into yet another thread. So the, uh, the server socket has its thread for listening, basically your listening port and your listening thread, and then you've got the thread that actually handles the communication uh, along that socket. And remember, unlike UDP, there's not just one socket for each port, there is a socket for every port, IP address, source, and source IP address pairing. So those four things together are what specify a socket. The source and destination port and the source and destination IP all have to match for something to get directed to that socket that gets created. So uh, we're creating a new socket every time a new person connects from a new IP address, and we can also even create a new socket if somebody from the same IP address sends us traffic but from a different port, a different uh, outgoing port. So that's also a way that you can have the same service connect to uh, a TCP stream multiple times. All right, so going on to the worker, the worker's threaded. In the example, I tried to do some different variations on threading, so this one's threaded a different way. It extends thread instead of having a runnable. Okay, and one of the things I did here that I didn't see anybody else really do is that I maintained the color. Oh, somebody asked, are we going to settle the remaining disputes from Monday for the red-blue challenge today? So uh, let's put those off till Friday because I haven't had a chance to get a good look at them. I didn't realize quite how much you people wrote, but no, I, I really didn't get a chance to have a look at those, so we're going to put those off till Friday. As my clips running here. I'm also going to go ahead and copy the file over. Let's see here. All right, it doesn't like that. It doesn't like folders, I guess. Happy with that though. Where do these things go? All right.
get there soon. Hopefully at least a few of you are doing the same. I'd like to see how many users we can actually support at a time before it craps out. My suspicion is it's not going to be too many on the VM. I was pretty successful. I got it up to three or four on my network before it had any issues. Let's, let's see how, how many I can support on the VM here. All right, so I'm going to run the server, which is obviously the uh, grid thing. And then we'll see what my IP address is here. So you can connect to me. So I am 143.105.165.12. And it's port 6112, of course, so I don't think you'll have to make any changes in the client. And on the client's end, you change the IP uh, right up there. That was one thing that a few of you did that was pretty annoying. You had the IP address hidden somewhere deep down in the program, maybe even in a different class. It should really be at the top of driver. If it's not at the top of driver, that's pretty annoying. <laughs> okay, so I am 143.105.165.12. I got one more connection in from somebody else. All right, I'm going to pick... Uh, pimp and pink is my color. Hmm, that's not pink enough for me. Go a little bluer, I think, to get pink. All right. Beautiful. <laughs> Pretty laggy. Let's hit up the uh, large cursor so I can really dominate here. Okay, and let's see how many folks I have connected. So it looks like we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine at least. Some a couple people closed their connections, so we've got nine at least. For now, we're still sort of able to draw. It's definitely losing its capabilities as we speak. But we are supporting nine people relatively well. When it was just the two people, it was quite a bit more performant. No, not bad. All right, I'm also going to close my receiving end so that I can dedicate all of my resources to the server side. Okay. Not bad. I mean, it's updating in real time on my end, with the receiver closed, I think it has enough bandwidth to really uh, manage it. Look at all that drawing go. Yeah. Okay, so as we see, we've got some real-time networking action going there. I'm going to move this over here so we can keep watching that beauty. Let's see if it keeps on performing. All right, so how do we do that? How do we get, you know, 10 people or so or 20 or more to be able to draw in real time on a machine as crappy as our CSVMs, no less? Uh, a machine that does not have a ton of resources, especially networking resources. Uh, although we are all on the LAN, which is good, so the delay is very low because all the CSVMs are physically right next to each other. So that definitely helps things. But nonetheless, it's uh, definitely a lot of bandwidth flying around right now. So what I did in order to make this magic trick as easy as possible was I serialized the color array for the display. So the grid, remember, has a array of grid units, and each of those grid units has a color. And in order to pull this off in, let's say, the uh, least effort way, I serialized those objects, and then I sent those over the network whole. So this is going to be a really inefficient approach, as we're going to see. I'll have some slides in a bit when we'll look at this. 
But first, all right, one of the things that I did, uh, <laughs> someone says we can't draw in individual brushes. One person changes everyone's brush size. Yeah, that's probably true. I probably just omitted that. And this is why, by the way. So thanks for pointing it out because I'm, I'm literally right in there. So when you change the color or the brush size, a lot of people changed the color in the grid. And that required you to have a separate grid uh, class for the client and the server. It also required you to somehow maintain those separately for each client. The easiest way, I thought, to get a different color for each client is to have the color stored in that client's um, receiving worker. So this is that client's receiving worker. Uh, in this case, uh, the color defaults to black if you don't specify one, but as soon as it launches, it actually sends the default color over the network, so that gets overwritten to cyan anyway. But as the system gets updated with new colors, it changes it here inside of the worker, and then the grid can access it from here. So that's something I didn't see anybody else do. That's a relatively good improvement. So you can maintain all those different things that the network communicates inside of the networked resources. Uh, I saw a couple people not thread this. It was sort of necessary to thread it. It was actually possible to pull it off with one worker, not having it being threaded, but with multiple workers. So multiple clients like this, it definitely has to be threaded. Uh, so in this case, I have it in the run method. It creates that reader, and then it uh, just runs this receive input method forever. OK, now for the bonus, if you want to receive from the client as well. So we've got the sending happening forever as well, uh, as well as the receiving. So we've got the receiving from the standard credit happening here. That's pretty straightforward. I think almost everybody got it. You know, you get a line. If it's got A at the beginning of it, you parse out the locations and draw the point in. If it's got an S, you parse out the locations, you update the cursor size. This is where the bug is here that allows only one cursor size to occur because instead of like the color, it's stored on the worker and then it refers to the worker. Well, the uh, cursor size is stored on the game and there's only one copy of the game that everybody shares. So of course, you all end up with the same cursor size. All right. Um, what a lot of people forgot to do was close the socket when it dies. So you'll see I have the occasional red thing here happen when a socket is closed. That's whenever you guys close it on the client end. And the easiest way to do that is just to catch the exception that occurs uh, after you fail to read from the socket. So whenever this line, uh, in dot read line, causes an exception, it's probably because the socket has been closed at that point. You can, if it hasn't been closed already, uh, try to do socket.close and then return in order to terminate the thread. So once you return here, the thread, this method is allowed to exit because the while loop is allowed to exit and then the thread will just terminate itself. So it's good to close up your system resources when you are finished. All right, now on to the bonus. If you wanted to do the bonus, then you had to have an additional thread in order to handle it. And so the thread that I had is this update client thread here. And that one uh, starts with the traditional runnable way that we saw because I've already extended thread and, and used it for the receiving end. So the sending thread updates the client whenever there are changes made to the server. And it has to update all of the clients. So how do we do that? Well, we'll see in some slides. Uh, yeah, let's go, let's go into the slides actually now, and then we'll look at the code some more later. Okay. I'm going to keep this beauty on screen. I'm truly fascinated that it continues to work. It's really, really a marvel. <laughs> take up a little bit more space than that. All right. 
So what is it that you have to worry about when you are making an application real time? And what applications are like this? What applications are multi-client and they have to update in real time? So we're talking about primarily games have the largest constraints here because games have the tightest responses necessary and also the generally the most people connected to them at once. So there are games that support, obviously, thousands of people playing at the same time. You get video calls and voice over IP chats of that nature occasionally, uh, and you'll notice they usually don't perform very well, if, especially if more than one person is talking. Voice over IP is really just designed for, um, at most, a few people to be talking at the same time. Uh, so generally only one person is talking at a time and quality starts to degrade once you get over a few dozen people. But you can also have video and uh, voice chats of a thousand people. I think that our convocation ceremony here at the beginning of the semester, they had to upgrade the Zoom license to support a thousand people because we got over our, our several hundreds people license. So I think we had over 300 in one chat, and it worked pretty well. So you definitely have that. Uh, and then we use Zoom for many of our larger scale meetings. Those are supporting something like 200 people. So it's still an issue for VOIP. And video is a big, a big field where this is applied. Uh, video takes up a lot of bandwidth, so you need to do a lot of tricks. And I don't just mean real-time video. The real-time video is the best example. I'm also talking about uh, video like this, like the one that you're watching now. So this live stream is going out to multiple users. So a lot of you are seeing this. Um, even though there's only one person uploading me, it still has to go out to all of you guys. And that's a pretty hard problem because I've got just the one internet connection. In this case, uh, YouTube acts as the server, but it still pulls off a lot of tricks in order to save bandwidth and do this in an effective way. So the basic problem is that clients send the server some data, and then that data creates a state on the server. In the little color grid drawer here, it's pretty obvious what the state is. The state is the you know, colors getting drawn. In video, it's pretty obvious what the state is. It's the current state of all my audio and visual and everything. And in audio, it's kind of obvious what the state is, too. You know, it's like my sound, or your sound, when you're talking on voice over IP. But there's always some kind of thing that we, we can call the state that the server needs to update all of the clients of. So whenever a client communicates something to the server in this kind of multi-user setup, the server has to redirect it to all of the clients. That's the situation we've got here. We've got uh, anytime the client sends info, that needs to be communicated to all of the other clients. So the server updates its state internally and then tells all of the other clients its state. And there's a a rare Pepe forming I see in the drawing application now. So clients send out their inputs, essentially, uh, whether those be their keystrokes, like Pepe over here getting drawn, or whether those be state updates. Those are uh, inputs from the client, like uh, you know, the, their own voice, their video, whatever, and then they receive updates back from the server on what's happened. First concept we're going to look at are keys. So this whole application that I've got now relies only on keys because it's a very simple version. A key is when the server sends its entire state out. So uh, the server sends an entire copy of its state. In this case, it sends out everything that, you know, the, the entirety of Pepe here. It doesn't just send, uh, let's say, a few lines of his face or something. It has to send all 2,500 squares that we see there. And sometimes you see key referred to as key frame or intraframe or iframe, and especially in video, those terms are used more often. So in video, even when your video is not networked, we still use keyframes, and we use them to keep the uh, file size significantly smaller. So almost every video codec out there is going to use some kind of iframes or keyframes in order to keep file size down. And so you'll see in video a keyframe 
Usually every one, two, sometimes up to 10 seconds, there will be a keyframe. And if you've ever had to scan through a video, so even a video on your local hard drive, but also videos on YouTube, you see those little previews that come up. Well, the previews are only generated usually at keyframes. So whenever you see those little previews coming up, those are all the keyframes. And all the in-betweens are what we're going to look at um, a little bit later. Sometimes when you're using one of those video applications, you'll see that you can't quite get to a specific second. Sometimes it has to go to that second and then kind of uh, fast forward real quick, right? And that's part of the same situation there, that it has to start from a keyframe and then advance a little bit to where you actually want to be. In gaming, this is sometimes called a tick. So gaming, we sometimes refer to what the server is doing as simulating the world space. So in gaming, clients send their input to the server, and the server applies those inputs to the simulation. It's usually basically a physics simulation of some sort. And then it sends everybody an update of the entire simulation space. So we say that the, ter the server has advanced one tick on the simulation. So it's advanced one, I don't know, uh, whatever unit you want to use in the simulation space. And it sends all the clients the full, basically, information about what's going on in the simulation at that point. But sending the entire state is really expensive, as we're going to see for our Pepe friend here. And compressing the state is a big focus of optimizing your networked applications. So let's see how uh, Pepe here is being transmitted. So in color grid, we have 2,500 grid units. We have a 50 by 50 grid. How much would it cost to send the whole thing? So how much would it cost to serialize that entire object and send it? Well, it would cost a ton because grid units have color and X and Y positions and other object overhead. Going back to the code, if we look at what comprises a grid unit, it's got an underlying rectangle 2D display that would need to be transmitted as well. Now it's private, so that doesn't get serialized by default, uh, so that wouldn't get sent. Uh, and then it has a color, but then it has a lot of other baggage that's probably going to get transmitted. So it would be very expensive to send the whole grid unit along. Thousands of bytes. So what's the bare minimum that we need to send? Let's think about that first. So the bare minimum that we need to send is probably just the color. We have basically 2,500 colors here. That's the crux of it. We can recreate the grid units and everything. If we've just got the color, we can do that. So I, I've talked about the serialization thing a couple of times. It's basically a fancy mechanism, a little magic that Java can do, where you can just give it an object, and it will convert it into bytes, and then you can do whatever you want with it. You can send it over the network, you can save it in a file, and then you can pull it back up later, and it will reassemble the object for you as it is. And it happens to be that color is already serializable. Most of the built-in Java functions are already serializable. So you can convert a color into bytes, send it over the network and extract it, and convert it back into a color on the receiving end. This is a wonderful, magical thing. Let's see how it happens, because it's actually not as complicated as you might think. So on the sending end, on the client, we have to create an input stream and an object input stream. So we haven't used an object input stream yet. And we set those bad boys up there, as you would expect. Um, on the client, in addition to transmitting, it is now receiving these object input streams. OK, so on the server's end, do, 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 we've created a, oh, that would be on the worker. We've created a output stream and then an object output stream. And again, those are set up uh, in the constructor there. And then we, again, on the server's end, now have to transmit in addition to receiving. So let me find the transmission here. Oh, as simple as that. OK. And then for the game function, so I went to the grid game manager and I added two new methods. And what these two methods do is they will serialize and then deserialize the game. So these are used by the 
uh, server, the server serializes the game and sends it to all the clients, and then the deserializing is used by the clients, which receive it from the server, and then turn it back into a valid grid. So we don't want to send all the grid units, so all this does is it loops through the grid units that we have, and it extracts just the colors, because we don't have a 2D array of the colors anywhere else here. So it generates a 2D array of the colors, and then it returns that 2D array of colors. On the receiving end, it takes a 2D array of colors and it puts them into the array of grid units. So it just changes all the colors of the grid units to match that 2D array of colors. So nothing actually happening there with serialization. We are just extracting and uh, replacing colors. All right, so let's start on the server's end there. All we have to do is write to the output stream, that object output stream, with object out dot write object, and we give it that two-dimensional array of colors as an argument. So remember, game dot serialize game returns that two-dimensional array of colors that represents all the grid units. It writes that whole thing to the output, and then on the receiving end, at the client, it receives that thing. Uh, obviously in a try-catch, like everything else, it receives that two-dimensional array of colors, and then it attempts to deserialize it, which is put them back in the grid. So really just like 15, 20 lines of code, and most of that is converting the array of grid units into an array of colors and then back again, because we didn't have an array of colors already. So not particularly complicated. Let's look at how much overhead it actually endures. So uh, what do you think? How much, how big are these transmissions going to be? How big is a key update that's done in this manner? Well, let's find out as soon as my screen resizes. Okay. Hopefully at least somebody is still connected here. I probably should have been running Wireshark earlier. I am actually running it on the right machine this time, right? Okay. I'm pretty confident that this is in the VM. Yes. All right. So I just need, uh, let's say it's TCP and the source is myself. Hmm. That would be 6112, I think. Okay, so yeah, these are all game state updates. Let's have a look at what they look like. 1,024 bytes, a bunch of queues. Hmm, a bunch of queues. All right. How long are they? How long is a game state update that's transmitted in this manner? And can we extract the raw RGB values out of this? It's hard to tell how long they are, right? So we need to basically look for a repeating pattern in how these transmissions go. Now it looks like there's only one person that's still connected to me, the dot .47 person. If more people connect to me, you'll see that it has to send a separate update, a separate key to everybody. So, let's see. Yeah, feel free to reconnect so we can see this. If you, if you run it again, you'll see that it starts sending a separate key to every additional user. All right, now how long are these transmissions really? Well, Let's look for a repeating pattern. We have this 722 here. Where's the next 722? It's up here. And then we have another one up here. And then we have another one up here. So this is probably like the last packet in, the, in this transmission. Uh, the whole sending of that serialized data probably spans somewhere between these two. So it's probably like the sum of everything between. 722, something like that. So it's probably on the order of like 10,000 bytes. So we could figure this out by just printing out how big the color array is in bytes uh, before we transmit it. But I just want to show you how it looks in Wireshark, that it actually does flag the push flag on every individual transmission, that it carries over multiple 
multiple, multiple packets, and that they all just kind of look like nonsense because it's just your object being converted into bytes. So you can't actually see the RGB values here or anything. You're just seeing uh, cues occasionally. So there's nothing there's nothing readable in there. And that a, a single update might take uh, many, many segments to finish. So you're looking at, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of segments coming in before this is done. Let's see if anybody else has connected here. So I'm still only sending them to dot forty seven. So either I've got my filter wrong or I still don't have any other connections. Well, I don't have any others logged in console, so it looks like it's still just dot forty seven. All drawing by themselves. Lonely. Right, but for every additional person that connects, it needs to send one of these very large, something like 10,000 byte um, keyframe updates periodically. So how do I pull that off? Because that's a lot of bandwidth, right? First, let's see how we can improve this. How can we further compress this? I got a couple more. Let's uh, go have a look at those. So. Once 57 connects, now we see that both 57 and 47 need to be updated. And now we can see a little bit more clearly, I think, how long a full update is. So this whole range between there and there before the 57 start, that's basically 47's turn to receive the info. So we're looking at 1024 plus 2048, 2048, 2048, 1024, 2048, 2048, and 722 to transmit the game state once. So we're looking at something like, uh, oh boy, uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13,000 bytes or so to transmit that entire two-dimensional grid. And that's 13,000 bytes that we need to send every tick to every single person. So you can understand why it gets bogged down pretty fast. Let's move Pepe over here while we continue to look at some slides. It's, it's kind of you all not to kill Pepe. Let's think about how we can improve this. What's the bare minimum that we actually need in order to send the state out? So what's the most efficient that we can be when sending the state. This is an optimization that actually usually makes sense to do. So we typically don't want to optimize until we absolutely have to, but this is a situation where you're going to run into have to pretty quick. So as you can see from the drawing app, it started to experience some performance issues already when there were just 10 of you connected. So uh, even on a network where everybody is local, and we probably have a pretty fair amount of bandwidth available to us, maybe not the best uh, system resources, but pretty fair bandwidth. We were already running into some performance issues. So how can we make it so that these ticks are smaller and we have less of those performance issues? Well, color has three values, red, blue, and green, and we know that each of those is between 0 and 255. That means they fit neatly into a byte. So the least we can send for each color is three bytes. We could fit all the colors into three bytes if we wanted to. So first, let's convert the colors into three byte units. That leaves us how much data in order to send it this way? Well, we have to do 2,500 colors if we're sending the entire state. So that's 7,500 bytes. Remember, it's a 50 by 50 grid, so 2,500 big. If it's three bytes for each grid unit, and it's 7,500 bytes. So how many segments is that? Anybody remember how many segments that would be? How many segments is 7,500 bytes going to be split into? as you are thinking about how many segments that'll be. Let's think about another way that we can split this down even further. So typically, colors repeat, and we can see this with Pepe here. He's got a lot of white over there. He's got a lot of white over there. He's got a lot of green around here. When he gets a black, he tends to get a lot more blacks consecutively. When he gets a white, he tends to get a lot more white consecutively. So let's try to figure out a way to encode repetitions so that we don't have to send absolutely every single color that's in the grid. Let's figure out a way that we can encode repetitions into the grid. Someone said eight. 
eight segments. So if it's 7,500 bytes and you get uh, somewhere in the ballpark of 1,400 bytes in your standard segments payload, uh, eight works. I think you can get away with fewer. Something like five or six, probably. If it's 1,400, 7,500 divided by 1,460 or so in the payload. Brings you five or six segments. Still not great to have to send five or six segments per tick. All right, so how can we encode repetition? Well, we send the color, so the same way that we sent it before. Uh, six, then. Five wasn't quite enough. I can't divide good. So we send the color as we sent it before, and then we also send something to indicate its location. So the least amount of data that we can use to specify location in bytes is going to be 2 bytes, because 2,500 doesn't fit neatly into 1 byte. All right, And so we could send a message like 255, 255, 255, and then 2500 to indicate that all 2500 tiles are white. So the X is just illustrative. We wouldn't actually send an X. But we're indicating there that all 2500 tiles are white. So in that scenario, we have managed to save 7495 bytes because we've managed to transmit the entire state in that little five byte chunk. If the entire screen is white, that represents the entire state. The client can easily decode that on their end into a viable grid. But what if there's one tile in the middle, one pixel, that's been set to blue? Well, we can say, all right, the first 400 tiles, if we're addressing these just in like a serial order instead of in two-dimensional forms, we're saying the first 400 are white, and then the next one is blue, and then the next 2,099 are white again, well, that's still a savings of 7,985 bytes. Now, the savings obviously go down the more complex the image is. And this is true of most video encoding codecs as well. Video encoding codecs rely a lot on this kind of repetition. And so on images where or on, in videos where all the different parts of the screen are really different, uh, you will tend to see the greatest degrading in visual quality and the highest bandwidth consumption and the highest file storage. So one of the most difficult things uh, to save efficiently is a video of, say, snow, for example, because uh, there will be little snowflakes across the entire display, and then you'll also have the actual colors of all of the stuff that you're looking at. And so everything is a little bit different, and the colors are constantly changing. So it's really difficult to encode videos in snow. And so if you watch a video on YouTube or something that has snow, you'll see that it lags quite a bit. There are other reasons for that we'll look at in a bit, but that's one of them. And uh, my math here is great. That's obviously supposed to be 7,485. You didn't just gain 500. Whoops. But in the worst case, this can be much more expensive. So in that case where every single pixel is a different color and you can't encode repetition at all, then this becomes an overhead of an additional 5,000 bytes. But that's pretty rare. It'd be pretty difficult for every single pixel to be a different color. So in the average case, it's probably a savings. But we can actually go further. We don't need the whole two bytes to represent location. If 2,500 is the largest location that we can have, Technically, we only need 12 bits to represent that. 2 to the 12th is just over 4,000. That gives us enough room to represent it. Unfortunately, 2 to the 11th is too small. You can only get 2048. So we need at least 12 bits to represent the location. Well, great, that leaves us 4 bits to do something else with. Okay, but is this really worth it? Is it worth it to split things up on a bit level? I would argue usually no because dealing with bits becomes a big headache unless you can split things up into bits while still keeping multiples of bytes. So this would be things like half bytes or three bytes or four bytes. Let's say, for example, you needed to encode four locations of 12 bits each. Four times 12 is, if I'm doing my math correctly, 48. 48, right? So we can 
find the lowest common denominator between 12 and 8 and just do some multiple that way, okay, or uh, we can not because this is generally not worth the overhead. If you have it in multiples of bytes, so like a half byte or two bytes or three bytes, then you can easily extract the underlying ones that you've used using a series of bit shift operations, like many of you did when you were doing the conversion of the subnet into dot form from slash form. You did some fancy bit shift wizardry. You can do that in order to extract, let's say, the first 12 bits of a 2-byte message. It's not particularly difficult. Uh, and so sometimes it becomes worth it just so you can pack a couple of extra things in there. And then we'll see from things like the TCP header that they've done the same thing, right? So they don't use even multiples of bytes, whereas other headers, like the UDP header, they try to use only even multiples of bytes for simplicity. So that TCP header has a bunch of one-byte flags and things that don't quite fit neatly into um, eight-byte chunks, uh, whereas other headers try to stick with the uh, just use whole bytes philosophy. There's also the use of existing compression, because compression is already a big field of both computer science and mathematics. There's a lot of people studying how to do more effective compression. You've got your zip, your 7-zip, your r, your tar, all these different uh, mechanisms to compress files, and they use things that are very much like that previous example where they count repetitions, but also much more complex mathematical concepts in order to compress and decompress files quickly. So in order to use one of those, you would get your data in its most raw form that you can get it, so let's say those three byte colors, and then you would compress it and then decompress it on the other end. Now doing all of this, the compressing and the decompressing, obviously takes time and processing power on both ends. So the client, or we'll call them the sender, I guess is more accurate in this case, because in the application that we're looking at in Color Grid Server, it's actually the server that has to do the compression and the client that has to do the decompression, right? So, uh, so the sender has to compress everything, the client has to de the sender has to compress everything, the receiver has to decompress everything, and this takes time and processing power. So is this worth it? And the answer is typically yes. As we can see in Color Grid here, network resources tend to run out way before resources on the system do. So the inefficient tick functionality here is the main reason that it stops being performant once a you know, greater than, it looks like, five or six people connect. It starts to encounter some latency issues. So because networking resources are usually the scarcest, we tend to prioritize networking resources above the computer resources. There are exceptions. So let's say you have an embedded device that runs on a battery and it has very limited processing power. Then, of course, you would probably prioritize that device's processing power and battery life. But generally speaking, we want to send as little over the network as possible and prioritize uh, getting the sender and receiver to do all of the work uh, before they put it into the network. That said, there's no way to send pure state anyway. You're always going to be doing some manner of compression and decompression on both ends. So what I've done in this example, where I've serialized the entire color array, is kind of the, the bare minimum. Um, but it's not particularly faster than decrypting 2,500 colors from their 3-byte uh, triples. In fact, it's probably slower because the object serialization system is not super duper fast. Uh, so there's really no way to just send pure state regardless. Uh, you might as well, as you're sending the state, send it in the most efficient way that you can do so. All right, we'll pick this up and look at it some more, so I encourage you to take a peek at the example and see how it does all of the base credit stuff, because the next homework will ask you to continue to build on all of that stuff again. All right, hopefully I will have a look at your red-blue challenges, and we will work those out on Friday. And I will see you guys then.